Okay. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to the latest NCAT webinar on Recovering Mobility as a Service today. Let's go to our PowerPoint. There we are. Okay, uh, this webinar is brought to you by NCAT, the National Center for Applied Transit Technology. And for some reason, our technology is not working. Okay, give me a moment. All right, well, I will start anyway. So uh, what are we going to discuss today? We're going to discuss the importance of mobility as a service, which is the hot term, and it's often used to very flexibly, let's put it that way. We're going to talk about what's happening in urban areas and promising initiatives for rural and small urban areas in the US. Uh, we have three great presenters and I will introduce them right before each of their uh, presentations. We have Carol Schweiger, Dwight Nengel, who's the Chief Transportation Planner of Tompkins County, and Dr. Caroline Rodier. She's a researcher at the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California at Davis. And let's see if we can get this screen share going, which was of course fine before we uh, started the webinar. There we go. Excellent. So what about NCAT? NCAT started uh, up in late 2019. We are housed at Community Transportation Association of America and we're funded and we work in cooperation with the Federal Transit Administration. Here you see our mission, which I think we are carrying out today, which is talk, talk about new technologies, new business models made possible by technology um, in reference primarily to small urban, rural and tribal transit systems. And you can find us at our website, which is now live, and I won't take up any more of our precious time with this introduction. We have lots of resources and information there, and you can sign up for our newsletter where you get probably the best information. It's on a monthly basis, or follow us on every kind of social media. I think we're on everything except TikTok these days. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Carol Schweiger whom probably many of you are familiar with. Carol has been in the field of transportation technology for over 40 years, and she is an expert on not only mobility as a service, but many, many of the topics that touch uh, rural and small urban transit systems. She's nationally and internationally known. Uh, she had ride ranging, in-depth experience in uh, systems engineering technology strategies for public agencies, uh, transit and paratransit technology, and traveler information strategies and systems. She's worked with over 65 transportation agencies, um, developing technology strategies based on needs assessments, developing technical specifications and structured profit processes. I won't go on anymore. There's, she's, we could go on an hour just with uh, Carol's experience. Um, she's also developed uh, and delivered modules for um, NTI and she's developed, been the lead uh, instructor, instructor, excuse me, for NTI. And she's also authored five uh, TCRP synthesis reports. And she authored and co-authored um, a couple of TCRP reports as well. Okay, and without further ado, I will hand this over to Carol. And Carol, if you want me to advance the slides, just let me know. All right, I think I will request the remote control here. Okay. Give you a bit of a break. There you go. And I am going to just stop my camera so everybody can, hopefully everybody can see the slides. Yes, we can. Excellent. And let's move right into the first slide, which is just giving everybody uh, an idea of what I'm going to cover today. Thanks to NCAT for setting this webinar up and talking about such a timely 
subject as mobility as a service. And hopefully by the end of the webinar, people will feel a little more comfortable about what is mobility as a service. And as you look at the outline of my presentation, I want our participants to keep two things in mind. One, mobility as a service is not an app. That, that is a big misconception. And secondly, it is a little more complex under the surface. And so we're gonna talk about some of the challenges associated with mobility as a service, particularly in rural areas, because the original concept was for major urban areas and it had a different set of objectives. So now that you can kind of see what my presentation roadmap is, uh, let's move to definitions. So what I've put up on the screen here, which I'm not gonna read all of the, the words to you, but mobility as a service is a concept within which in a one-stop shop, you can plan a trip, you can book a trip, and you can pay for your trip. And, and those are the three most important words that you're gonna hear as we go through all the presentations today. And I wanna tell you this definition and the definition below it for mobility on demand, first of all, they're very different concepts, but these are being refined in uh, SAE J3163, which is a taxonomy of shared mobility terms. So if you Google J3163, you will see a taxonomy of shared mobility terms, and we are adding mobility as a service, mobility on demand. A little further down, shared mobility, which is an even broader concept. I think that doesn't need any definition. And at the very bottom is the Federal Transit Administration's definition of mobility management. And I want to come back to that later because frankly, in my mind, there is a direct relationship between mobility as a service and mobility management. So let me move on. And here, this is directly from the Federal Transit Administration. I want you to focus on really the, the last bullet on this slide. Mobility as a service really doesn't exist without a very strong partnership among mobility service providers as well as private sector partners who may be actually providing the mobility services or they might be providing a technology platform and there's a obvious direct partnership with travelers. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. And, and I wanted to show you this very briefly that there, there is this thinking about supply and demand. So what are our issues in rural areas is that our supply is perhaps not as plentiful so our supply of mobility services, we need to go back. I don't know how. Cheryl, if you can move the slide back, I'm trying to do it, but it keeps moving forward. Can you just move okay, the slide let me, back? Because I'm trying to. I Let me stop sharing because it's not. Okay. That's good. Not doing it for me. Let's and then see. I can just have you advance the slides. Okay. Make it easy for everybody. Okay. Let's so see. So you can back up a few. I don't know why it is not. 
and then okay. I can certainly it's working now can you see it I can't okay see you but I can't see the, the all right screen. let me one second showing and, that all technology and if not I'll just share my screen okay one second let me see if it works now let's go to play you can play from the start okay because you have to back up a ways am i backing up yeah now go okay. one right there oh, no, okay no back one okay that's that's perfect okay and what i'll do is i'll advance the slides now okay backed up so because if you click on anything i think you're you're advancing them too okay so, okay so all i wanted to say on this particular slide is in it jump it keeps jumping forward so cheryl i think i don't know why because i'm not clicking anything okay are you where you need to be no back up oh, okay Okay, and then anything I think that you are clicking is making it go forward. Okay. Not sure. Not okay. Really sure. All right. So in rural areas, we don't have as much of a supply of transportation, and I'm actually going to come back to this. So the perhaps this chart would be a little unbalanced. Right now, we're showing a direct balance between supply and demand demand for mobility services and supply and i want to come back and revisit that because that's a very important feature in um in okay so actually i'm going to skip over this slide i wanted to get to this one and this is a very simplistic way of looking at the concept of mobility as a service. And I'm just going to point out a couple of key things on this chart. So it utilizes shared assets. So for example, if there's any kind of ride sharing, and I don't mean Uber or Lyft, I mean the old carpooling, van pooling. We're going to come back to that. That is an asset. That's a shared asset that can be used. Then we have some personalized services that I think Dwight is going to cover really, really well in his concept of mobility as a service and what he will be building in Tompkins County. And then we have some facilitators. We can provide some incentives. Uh, the slides just jumped forward again. Can can we okay. can we go backwards? Yeah. Yes. I For some reason it gets I didn't advance it, so I don't know why. I don't know why it's, it yeah, seems to get stuck that. every once in a while. I apologize. I think, why don't I just show mine? Okay. And and then we can um the Okay, we can why don't off. you request screen share? Yep. Okay. And then I'll okay, go excellent into slideshow mode. So, so here, just to wrap up, um, so you've got you can provide incentives for people to use, um, you know, to use mobility as a service. Up in the upper right hand corner is connected living, which I also want to focus on. That's so important in, in rural communities in terms of healthcare, education, entertainment, getting people to those activities that are really life activities. We have some on demand services, but the core of mobility as a service you can see is right in the center. It's the customer. It's the person who wants to make a trip. And the other backbone of this typically is public transport, which, which I've 
highlighted. So let's kind of focus on some differences. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus on what makes mobility as a service somewhat challenging in a rural environment. And that's kind of where I have that big red arrow. You know, although mobility as a service is more challenging in a rural environment, there are some common features in different geographic regions. So remember the definition, part of that definition is Moss is a one-stop shop. That's true no matter what geography you're in. You also want to be able to facilitate payment of a whole trip. That's common. You want to provide multimodal options for travelers. And you want to consider individual preferences. And again, I think Dwight's got some great examples there. And then we, we have that idea about incentives for people to use it. But you can see on the slide that there are some key things in rural areas. One challenge we have is to make transport overall efficient. And that's very hard to do, particularly when you're using services like taxis and a taxi is taking one person to one location rather than using shared modes. So we really would like to, as much as we can, kind of focus on the shared aspect of this. And we want to make sure that we have a sufficient level of services as well. And we really need to focus on accessibility and equity. So those are things that I think are important for folks to take a look at. So, so we do have this kind of lack of services in rural areas. And so sometimes in a rural area, what you might want to focus on is that first and last mile to get someone to a perhaps a public transport service, for example. And that public transport service may be miles and miles away from the rural area, but that could be one way of providing mo more mobility. And also, we want to look at things like uh, accessibility and equity of the service. Equity might be, for example, that somebody just pays as they go and they don't purchase a subscription, which is also discussed in the concept of mobility as a service, you have a pay-as-you-go option or you have a subscription option. Perhaps in the rural environment, you could have one or both of them. And we'll get to that in a bit. This is just a slide. I'm not going to read all the words to you. I want to focus on a couple of things that I've already mentioned, but I want to reinforce them. On the right-hand side of this slide, there are, is a relative priority of mobility services in a rural area if we're really looking at equity. And this was part of a very big study that looked at mobility equity across rural, suburban, and urban areas. And the relative priorities all look different. Here, you can see something like a carpool or a van pool that should be really a very high priority to provide that to the public. So, so that's, that's why it shows up as a high priority. And also people who have more efficient vehicles of their own, like electric vehicles, that should be made a priority. And then public transport, which may or may not be in a rural area, that, that should be a priority if it's there. So. So this slide is actually directly from Dwight, 
I am not going to take credit for it. But this goes back to our discussion about uh, the sort of lack of supply that we might have when we're looking across all of the mobility services that someone could use. And so Dwight's thought, and I thought he put it together in a picture really well, that sort of says, well, how could we boost the mobility supply, for example? How could we do that? We could provide some benefits for people that might drive a van pool. You know, we're gonna pay for the gas. Um, there might be some other incentives uh, on the driver's side. Uh, pretty much in rural areas, you're always looking for volunteers. There's never enough of them. So is there something we could provide them by way of incentives to maybe drive a van pool, for example? So, so here's where I would like to tie together the thought about mobility management a little bit. And this is a sort of reinvention, if you will, of that concept of mobility as a service. We've got our enablers, we've got our connected living, we've got all the same components that are centered around the traveler. But we can start to look at this in a mobility management sense. So what technologies do we need? Because we need some when we're talking about the bigger mobility management picture that we face in rural tribal areas and small urban areas. We also need the partnerships and the policies that allow us to provide some of those services through a concept like mobility as a service. And we certainly have data and reporting needs. So mobility as a service starts to look a lot like our typical mobility management needs. So one sort of food for thought for folks is when you're thinking about mobility, manage, mobility management or mobility as a service concept, I think it's very important to actually have some guiding principles. This, this is just an example for you of 10 guiding principles that not only guide the mobility as a service concept, but it also guides some of the policies that you might put in place for mobility service providers like a car sharing or bike sharing system. So I'm actually going to skip over these two slides, but I really like this was an interview with one of the visionaries in mobility as a service from Finland and some someone that that Dwight and I have actually uh, met before. And he's been asked, you know, yeah, so mobility as a service, it's an urban solution. And you keep telling us that it's actually possible in a rural sense. So that first sort of bullet there, mobility as a service is not about getting rid of cars. If you hear people say that, most of them are in urban centers. And what they're saying does not apply. This is not a one size fits all concept. It, it has to be tailored to the geography, to the people who are traveling. So uh, you can go back and take a look at these a little bit later. So uh, somebody that's sort of a visionary in mobility as a service here in the States is um, from AARP. And uh, Jana, you can see her name at the bottom of the slide here. She sort of said, gee, I really like this concept, but I'm not, again, I'm not sure it applies particularly to rural areas that tend to have a lot of demand response services. 
So she sort of said, well, to make this work, we need to look at the challenges that we have out there now with demand response. What are our challenges? You have to make reservations way in advance for a trip. That can be very inconvenient. There's often inadequate funding or the funds, you know, you get one set of funds this month, you get another set of funds three months later, your first set of funds run out, you know, before the second one runs out. So, so we have a bunch of challenges. So, so is there actually a universal concept that we can look at? And it comes back to the concept of mobility as a service. So here's how she pictured it. And again, I'm not gonna talk through all the details, but I want you to look at the lower right-hand corner of the slide here, where it says, community-based mobility platform. What do you see there? You see the elements of most rural services. There's volunteer drivers, there's veterans programs, there's a senior center. Um, then if you look at the box right above that, you've got human services that are available as well. So I think that's, um, that's a very important part of it. And the other thing that she does a very good job of is saying this platform or this concept needs to be open to everybody. We can't be using a lot of proprietary things. And that brings me to this slide, which says that um, you may have heard that Uber, just as an example, they developed what they call a mobility as a service app. And it actually is mobility as a service. It fits the definition. But what it doesn't do is it does not give the traveler all the possible options. For example, there's no option to get Lyft on an Uber app. So we call that a walled garden. And that's just a term that says that platform is more limited in terms of the number of services that it provides. So uh, this is an example. It's, it's a little more suburban than rural, but it's, it's Dayton, Ohio. And the reason for me presenting this quickly is that they decided as a public transit agency that they should really be in control of a concept like this. So they have started to build their mobility as a service system based on an integrated payment platform they operate a bike share system themselves. So they've taken that on and they wanna make sure that this is an equitable system that everybody can access. Then I wanted to give you an example from, uh, several of you might be familiar with the Michigan Mobility Challenge, which provided $8 million across many different projects in Michigan to show uh, advanced concepts in mobility, particularly for persons with disabilities. And this was a project that was called Ride to Go Go. Uh, the, the demonstration is over. It encompassed three rural uh, transit providers, and it had a lot of lessons learned in kind of the weeds which we don't have time to get into, but I gave you uh, a reference that you can go to and really look at. In fact, if you Google Michigan Mobility Challenge, you will come up to the Michigan DOT webpage and you can click on the documents that exist. This is another food for thought, like where do I even start? thinking about mobility as a service. 
And this is kind of a, I think, a neat timeline that says, look, we need to approach this slowly. And what are the important things that we need first before we really get too far along and we can't continue because we don't have the right building blocks? So this is their idea of building blocks. And I think it's really, really important that they started with the discussion of partnerships. And a lot of phase one is based on developing those partnerships and beginning to explore how those can work together in a mobility as a service system. And I did want to make you aware of a couple of different projects that are going on right now where in the not too distant future, there will be a tool for you to use that will help you figure out the readiness of your area for a mobility as a service system. This is just one example from a couple of years ago. This is in Australia. You can't read anything on the right hand side. There's another one that just uh, was developed and I'm hoping to get some information out to people in the white paper on that one. But that will be a tool that's available. And we can't forget, um, and I'm gonna close things out here. We can't forget that we need to evaluate how we did on building a system. And there are some great frameworks that are being developed to evaluate. And I'm not going to read through these. You'll have access to these slides, I believe. So I'm going to end it there since I went over my time and send it back to you. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Carol. And I just want to tell everyone that Carol is the author of the NCAT white paper that's going to be coming out on mobility as a service. So you can look forward to having that um, within the next couple of months. And we're going to go um, next to Dwight Mengel. Uh, many of you may have seen Dwight at, at a transportation conference uh, near you during the last few years. He's really been talking about his uh, mobility as a service plan. Dwight is the chief transportation planner of Tompkins County, New York, which is in and around Ithaca. Uh, and he is a 30 plus career year career developing community mobility services um, from positions in the Department of Planning, Public Works, Public Transportation and Social Services. And he directs an extensive mobility management and coordinated transportation planning program. Uh, he has been developing the, his current mobility as a service model for several years and he was selected as um, a grantee of the Federal Transit Administration for this proposal. And I believe he just uh, got a phase two grant not, not too long ago to implement the MOS program, which is scaled for small urban and rural communities. And in, I'm proud to say in 2015, uh, Dwight received uh, the George Drucker Memorial Award from the Community Transportation Association of America. And you will see how uh, innovative he is and he's very lucky to be working in an area that allows him the room to innovate. And Dwight, would you like to do your own slides or would you like me to uh, I would, do that? I would like to do my own. Okay, great. All, All right, right, just request, request that and I will approve you. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay, let me um, get going. And let me send this back because I just I selected the wrong one. So let me go back. <laughs> All right.
We are just showing a, a valuable lesson today, which is that no technology is error proof. It's amazing. So let me, uh, I am going to share the right screen now. So I'm going to stop sharing and bring it back in. Okay. Share screen. This one. Share. Very good. We're good to go. Hi, my name is Dwight Mangle. Um, talking to you from a very hot upstate New York, um, Tompkins County. Tompkins County is in the Finger Lakes region of uh, New York. It has about 102,000 people. 54% uh, live within one uh, smaller urban area, the Ithaca urban area, and 46% live in rural towns around Ithaca. We're fortunate to be a regional growth center We've grown in employment, economic development, and population um, consistently um, since I believe like 1920. 20% um, of our workforce commutes from outside of the, the county, uh, which is a, a lot. And our largest single employer is Cornell University. So we have a very diverse um, economic uh, sectors, but higher education and the healthcare uh, is over 50% of all the jobs and so forth. Um, mobility as a service. Everybody has their own definition. This is this is my simplified one, and we've been. Su successful in that in 2018, our county was accepted into FTA's on-ramp on program. Uh, we were ready to work on our local MOS concept. We received technical assistance from the Shared Use Mo Mo Mobility Center from Chicago. Um, and we've we have a lot of, we have a long history of incremental mobility innovation. And that's why we were selected for um, the on program that prepared us to apply for the FTA's IMI uh, funding um, last August, and we were awarded a grant in uh, March. So. Let's move on. We have a broad family of mobility services for our community. And it's when I say mobility service, I mean the actual mobility operators plus information services. Two unique services are Ithaca Car Share and Way to Go. Ithaca Car Share is the oldest, largest, most su successful community nonprofit car share in the state. Um, businesses, the public sector, and nonprofit agencies use car share to provide work related trips. In fact, they also use them to provide um, volunteer transportation trips to uh, services. Uh, car Share has a low cost membership plan for low-income households. And uh, moving on, the Way to Go program, which is operated by Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, create, created a comprehensive community mobility education program to inform people of their mobility choices. And since Cornell Cooperative Ex Extension has a over 100-year history, of um, their community-based education and outreach in, in the rural areas. Uh, they are, they have a lot of credibility in, in terms of their um, information and the Way to Go program. A Way to Go also trains employers and human service agency staff about mobility services to advise their employees and clients. And that 
was a critical missing piece because there are many people in every community who are advising people about what their choices and what their clients are and what their choices are and they really need to be informed so that they know where to go even if their customers don't. So um, <clears throat> before on ramp, we described our MOS idea as a single concept. Uh, after on ramp, we identified two phases and we're proceeding with the <clears throat> developing phase one. Excuse me. Um, phase one begins with multimodal trip plan. Uh, what is, is interesting is that right now, currently, only our public transit operator, which is called PCAC, and one of three commuter bus services stream real time location data usable by apps. Um, reliable trip planning will grow when more service providers publish real-time data. We are planning a new app that will evolve over time to publish and integrate all available mobility service data. At a minimum, there will be a one-button phone call directly to every mobility operator in our community or a link to their app. We realize that mobility services evolve on their own time. We hope that our investment in an app may encourage faster evolution. And the app is not only to be used by people on a smartphone, the app is, is really will, will be used, as I'll discuss later, in our 24-7 uh, call center to answer people's questions. So, MOS is closely allied to increasing the supply of mo mobility services, especially in rural areas. Way to Go works with nine volunteer driver programs to increase the number of drivers and improve coordination. We have a uh, Finger Lakes ride, ride share program uh, working regionally to increase the number of rideshare drivers to reduce the number of single driver com commuters. But which, as was as what Carol mentioned, um, supply and increasing supply, especially if you can do it in an organized way, is really essential uh, to to uh, uh, grow. Um, the last new service that we have coming on, on board is a uh, pilot uh, program with TCAT and our paratransit operator. They have a first mile, last, last mile pilot. Uh, they were all set to, um, to implement this in April. It's been postponed to the fall. Their, their app, which coordinates all of the logistics between the bus operators, the paratransit operator, and the uh, customers. Uh, have all, they, it has been tested, it has been field tested, it is ready to go. And um, so they're ready to go. So where this ends up as part of the MOS program is that our phase one project will fund TCAS first and last mile pilot for a second year in 2022 to better understand the feasibility of expanding the services uh, throughout the other rural towns in, in, in the county. And um, that's what we're uh, working on. <clears throat> customer service, multimodal 24 seven customer service. Last fall, I was recently in a, in a extremely large urban area in Texas that did not offer 24 seven information that could be verified by a human being when you called them up. 
And um, so that's a real goal that we have to, to uh, do it. And we have the capacity to do it because two of our existing service providers already offer 24 seven service. And that ends up being Ithaca Car Share and 211 information and re referral. Um, our new call center will help people plan trips and recover from trip failures. I cannot emphasize enough the ability to help people recover from failures when no matter what happens is completely essential to having people um, wanting to take the risk of using um, MOS or other types of uh, uh, services. Um, otherwise, when things go wrong, they go really wrong. And it's very uh, difficult to restore people's faith that they're not going to be stranded somewhere especially when they make the mistake. They missed the last bus. It's snowing and they, they weren't paying attention when the last bus was going to be leaving. Um, people make mistakes all the time and sometimes services fail to execute properly. You need to have really multimodal customer service. And I see that as integral, as important as multimodal trip planning for a, um, a, a, a MOS service. Now, when we do our pilot, we will be testing and evaluating our objective of supporting customers of all mobility services, but we're gonna have a phased approach in the growth of membership of the Guaranteed Ride Program over time. So we, we understand um, better in terms of what demand do we need to, what, what is the demand that this, will, this could likely cause for us and how can we create supply to assist people when they have problems. The general model here was to use a uh, AAA uh, type uh, roadside emergency uh, program, but apply it to everything else um, other than driving alone. So during the on-ramp program, we learned about the business model canvas and what you have before you is a business model canvas of our phase one uh, program. It's a useful tool for planning and documenting a project over time. It is a work in progress. It evolves throughout developing the business model. It will continue to evolve as you implement your business model and as you adapt your business model to what you are doing. Um, this is one of the really key uh, organizational tools that we found to um, articulate and look at the key relationships and values and costs and revenues and channel and customers being served. Um, and I strongly in, encourage you to, you know, Google business model canvas and um, learn how to use it. We found it extremely important. Business risk. Well, creating two phases to develop MOS allowed us to concentrate on the work elements we understand well. And we, I believe we understand phase one well. And we would assign that a relatively low, low risk. We know what we want to get from our multimodal trip planning and customer service. And I'm confident that we're gonna be able to organize the customer service center. Phase two though, there's many unknowns. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but we know there are potential partners to uh, help us with that. 
funding. Shortly um, to get to the point, the F FTEA awarded us $820,000 to begin developing phase, phase one, and we have two years to do it. We have two years, we have one year to develop it and one year to pilot it. And that's where we are. Lessons learned. Um, we've learned from the on-ramp program, um, we had a really good idea, but we needed to refine that into a successful proposal. So the first thing that we did, um, and we didn't do it willingly, but we came to the realization we really needed to, to split MOS into two phases. We needed to select a lead agency for phase one, um, which is the county's transportation planning unit. And we really need to keep looking to advance innovative practices in rural mobility and service delivery, including everything. Um, everything that we uh, uh, can do. And from, from, from this, I take some uh, theoretical guidance from Theodore Roosevelt, who said, do what you can with what you have where you are. And that is how we uh, began to um, develop phase one and apply to the, F, the FTA for a funding. And the last thing is don't overpromise. Um, it's better to underpromise and over deliver. And that is what we are uh, working on. Um, it, whenever FTA comes out with another on ramp uh, solicitation. If you have a good idea, I encourage you to apply. You will not only get good technical assistance to prepare you for a future funding opportunity, but you're going to learn a lot from your on ramp colleagues that are selected from around the country. Um, we had six people, I mean, six uh, entities from around, around the uh, country, and we all learned from each other, and it was extremely uh, useful. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to, uh, to uh, Cheryl. And I encourage um, any of you to reach out and contact me if uh, you want to have a further discussion about anything that I've presented and we can always uh, create a, a Zoom. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay, if anybody has questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, Rachel Fichtenbaum has a great question and Rachel, we're gonna wait till Caroline is done because I think this is a question that all of our presenters will um, have something wonderful to say about. And our next presenter is Dr. Caroline Rodier. She's from the other side of the country, from California. Caroline is a researcher at the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California at Davis. And her primary areas of research include transport, land use, and environmental policy analysis. Caroline was actually on our GTFS uh, webinar about a month ago. Her current modeling research involves the travel effects of alternative new shared mobility systems, including automated vehicles. And she's doing work in the rural uh, San Joaquin Valley, uh, serving disadvantaged populations. And she also recently authored a report on how autonomous vehicles and shared mobility can address driving challenges for people with developmental disabilities. So, uh, really getting to a lot of those equity and accessibility issues that we're always very interested in. Okay, Caroline, do you want me to uh, share my screen and advance my slides? I think I might be able to, no, why don't you advance the slides, I'll ask you. And I, I, there might be a part before I show the video where I request the screen because I can um, shorten the videos. So if you could go ahead and do the show the presentation. Okay, no. I'm gonna share my screen and let me just, it is not, my screen is not working. It worked 
before. Okay, I can, I'm sure I can do it if it's... I yeah, can, it worked It worked when we tested it out before the webinar, everyone, okay. but I'll take for some reason, there's some problem. Okay. Okay, do you want me to take it over? Yes, please. Okay. It says I cannot start sharing green while other participant is sharing. Okay, let me... One moment, let me see if I can. Uh... While you're doing that, I just, Dwight, your presentation was so inspiring. Um, in California, we're way behind you and we're just kind of um, at the very beginning of trying to experiment with increasing the type of supply you were talking about in our rural San Joaquin Valley. Okay, Caroline, why don't you request okay. uh, taking over the screen? Okay. And I apologize. Okay, excellent. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, I can't see it. You're, oh wait, maybe it's on the other side. Okay, here we go. Is it on the other side? We can see it. Okay, but I won't know, I won't be able to forward it. Let's see. Ah, here it is. Is this it? Here we go. I got it. Okay. No, I can't see it. Let's see. Um, Can you see it now? We're seeing the whole screen. Yeah, it, we did. It was perfect. A minute ago, a second ago. Can I stop share and start again? Sure. And I apologize to our attendees. Of course, everything worked perfectly when we tested this out before. Yes. That it did. That is the rule. Yep. It's not coming out. Okay. Up. I can't see it. We're just seeing your, your home screen. Yeah, I can't see the screen at all. Okay. So I think you're going to have to do it. And All right, let me see if I can um, go back and see if it'll work. And Cheryl, if you can't, I might be able to advance the slide. Okay, now can. it's advancing. One second. All right, I'm on. All right, I'm just going to quickly move through. We can't see them. Let me get to the right place and then I will... Okay, can you see it now? No. Okay. One moment. Okay. There we go. All right. We're in business. Okay, so I'll just tell you when to Just tell me when to advance, yes. Okay. Um, so the project I'm presenting today is the Ecosystem of Shared Mobility in the San Joaquin Valley. It's a case study that shows how MAS can link people and their travel needs to multiple integrated mobility services. MAS is now really becoming the backbone of a system of expanded mobility in the valley. Can you advance the screen, please? Okay, this is the overview. So I'm gonna start by briefly describing the valley, um, the problem motivating the, the project, and the background on the community-based planning study we used to develop our project concepts. And then finally, a more in-depth discussion of our MOS system, including next steps. So I'm gonna start with some geographic background on the San Joaquin Valley. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you to. Advance the slide, please. That's all right. Okay. Okay, advance the slide to the food basket of the world. Um, the, San the San Joaquin Valley is California's single most productive agricultural region and one of the most productive in the world. It produces more than half of the fruits, vegetables, and nuts grown in the U.S. In this map, you can see that the valley is dominated by agricultural lands. The small pink, pink areas are residential and commercial lands. And... Um, 
So I, I, those, you can't see the communities in pink that our project serves. So <laughs> they don't even really show up on this map. So um, just to let you know, um, you know, our, our locations are, are highly rural. Okay, California has classified uh, most of the valley as economically and environmentally disadvantaged. You can see the crosshatched areas. Um, and this is related to um, eligibility for funding, cap and trade funding for transportation and other projects. So this area has some of the worst air quality in the nation and high rates of childhood asthma. Next slide, please. Um, this project focuses on the problem of access, poverty, and emissions in the valley. Next slide. The challenges to rural transit service, you know, I'm sure everyone's familiar with, but I'd like to set the context for this specific pilot. Um, you know, we're, we're faced with divert, dispersed development patterns and long travel distances, which lead to low um, transit riderships and low fare box revenue. Um, this ultimately um, leads to cuts in available transit services. So most, most of our pilot communities if they're lucky, may have only um, one round trip a day to the nearest um, city in their county. Um, rural households living in poverty, sorry, are you there, rural households living in poverty? Um, no, I am. Okay, good. Low levels of transit service and the relatively high cost of personal vehicle ownership contribute to low access to opportunity. Next slide, please. In general, however, long travel distances and lack of alternatives to the personal vehicle lead to increasing levels of auto ownership, vehicle miles traveled, and emissions. Next slide. So in California, legislation requires metropolitan planning agencies or MPOs to develop land use and transportation plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have very aggressive greenhouse gas emission targets um, for our state. Uh, the Valley and the MPOs within the Valley were urged to develop plans for, uh, to, but, excuse me, to develop plans with measures that are typically applied in major urban areas. For example, transit oriented development and fixed route transit. However, the Valley was concerned about the efficacy of these urban measures in largely rural regions. You know, and in fairness, there's not a lot of peer-reviewed research on what works in rural areas and what doesn't. Um, you know, I, I love that Carol brought up the green outlining report of, you know, green lining recommendations. Um, you know, I, I think those are, are good, but they're largely uh, and interesting. However, they're largely green linings opinions. Um, a lot of what, um, a lot of the suggestions that are kind of imposed or suggested to the Valley really are not based on much evidence and um, are, they really feel very frustrated by them. It tends to be kind of an urban centric um, attitude in California in general. Since I've been develop doing research on rural areas, I've become a lot more sensitive to that. So, you know, in general, I think we need to be a lot more humble about what trying things, seeing if they work, modifying them or doing something again, because there's really not a lot of, um, there's not really not a lot of evidence for what works and what doesn't work in these areas. But anyway, as a result, we did a planning study to examine new technology and shared mobility services to meet mobility gaps and reduce emissions. Next slide, please. UC Davis led a community-based planning effort, effort in partnership with the Valley, which included stakeholder engagement, focus groups, and data analysis. Problems were inventory by location and included inner city transit gaps, very high tr cost transit routes, obviously to the, the provider, and services with low um, fare box recovery as well as communities with um, very low vehicle to adult ratios. 
We also identified and evaluated some new technology and shared multi, um, alternatives that looked plan promising and we felt like we could implement within a year. Next slide, please. So at the conclusion of the study, we identified three pilot concepts for implementation. Um, we secured financial support from Cal California's Low Carbon Transportation Fund to implement the project. Um, and these pilots include an electric vehicle car sharing service and affordable housing in the Southern Valley. Um, the pink areas are the rural site locations, the pink areas in the circles there. Uh, Moss in the Northern Valley. Um, Moss would be implemented throughout San Joaquin and Stanislaus County. And then a volunteer ride sharing service that um, serve the areas highlighted in pink, which are highly disadvantaged rurally, urban areas, rural areas with extremely low transit service. The MOSS platform was really envisioned to try to knit together existing and new services. Um, you know, as we anticipated, they would um, begin to expand throughout the valley through um, other low carbon community-based transportation projects. So in contrast to Dwight's Ithaca area, we have very few of the types of programs that, um, you know, non-transit programs that provide rides um, to um, com residents in these areas. Okay, next slide, please. So just really quickly, this is MioCar. It's our round trip um, electric vehicle car sharing service. The vehicles can be rented for $4 an hour and $35 a day. The goal is to provide car sharing at a price point that is more affordable than owning a vehicle to highly sensitive, price sensitive populations in the areas where these services are provided. And these, these, these communities also have extremely low transit access. So the hope is by increasing their accessibility and hopefully providing an alternative to a second own personal vehicle. And you know, I, we don't have time to talk about it today, but we've seen some very different usage patterns um, um, and people's willingness to travel to actually get to these cars. They're, they're willing to travel up to 15 miles and they often take transit actually to get to these cars. Okay, Vogo offers free, next slide, Vogo now. Vogo offers free rides to residents in rural disadvantaged areas, again, when transit is not an option. As the volumes of rides grow, so does ride sharing. Um, volunteers yeah. provide rides with their own vehicles and are reimbursed at a per mile IRS reimbursement rate. The local nonprofit moves, recruits and trains drivers and um, the Volunteer Transportation Center, I think many of you in upstate New York are familiar with them. They are providing our back office dispatch scheduling and routing service. Um, we were really on a very tight timeline to get this going. Um, so we, we drew on expertise you know, in the US and um, outside of the US. Reservations can be made up to two days in advance via our MOS system, which I'm going to delve into now. Next slide, please. So um, now I'm gonna go talk a little bit more about our MOS system and uh, now that I've shared kind of the background on this, this study. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you kind of what our perspective was. Um, I think it kind of jives with, with what Carol was, was talking about, but this was kind of our perception of the user um, system for MOS, you know, we wanted to, we envisioned a user wanting to know what's the best way to get from A to B by time and cost for all available modes. Um, when will my ride arrive? Um, is the space available um, on the service I've provided? Can I reserve a space and then can I pay now? Next slide, please. This is our... There we go. There we go, okay. This is our little... Um, our interpretation of MOS from a systems perspective, you know, we start thinking in contrast to Carol's, maybe I think Carol's might be better, she starts from the user, but we, we kind of focused on what the MOS platform couldn't do. Um, and then 
you know, what, what needed to, to be integrated with the platform in order to answer our user questions. So it, we see the platform as integrating different services in their data. The smart, interface, smart app is the interface between questions and answers that the users might have. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. How do computers communicate? This may seem really basic, um, but we found that this is a key problem with practical MOS app implementation for right now. Um, our vendors for our MOS were the QD company in, um, in Norway, and also our, we worked with Trillium on the Open Trip Planner. So the MOS platform needed to communicate that we, you know, that we contracted with, needed to communicate with mobility services via um, APIs and data. However, we found that many service providers don't want to connect to the MOS because of concerns about competition, protection of software secrets, and sometimes they don't even have an, an API or they say they don't have an API. So if there's an existing contract, it can be really tough to get them to connect to the platform. Um, if a service provider is willing to connect to the MOS platform because there's no standard APIs and data structure for the integration, each integration is an expensive one-off and it can cost anywhere from ten dollars to $30,000 just on the MOS side, you know, not including what, what the vendors, what it costs to the vendor to modify their app or data structure or anything. So, or protect their secrets. Because of these challenges, we, really, we have recommended to our program partners that they require a contractual agreement with subcontractors that they will integrate and pay for the integration with Moss. So, I mean, if you're just starting this, it's really an important thing to start discussing with your vendors because we had a really hard time with our dial a ride providers in particular. Okay, next slide, please. I'll go through this really quickly. So I think Carol touched on this today in the US private companies such as Uber and Lyft use Moss apps to promote their mobility services. You know, in some major urban areas, transit is included in the app. Users must pre-select the modes they want to use. At the time I did research on this, I couldn't find an example where um, you know, they were combining many of these, the services available in one trip. For example, e-bike to transit to ride hail from location A to B, that may have changed now. Uh, maybe Carol can comment on that later. Um, so this was our grand vision of a public moss in the San Joaquin Valley. We really, next slide please, sorry about that. Um, the open public MOS model would include all available services. They would be combined to provide mo mode choices to, to more destinations and to minimize travel time and costs given um, the, the user needs. So we see it as a public facing platform that may lower barriers to market entry, especially for, for small local providers that may pop up in, in some of these rural areas. And, you know, we'd like to foster those certainly. And increase service supply and lower costs with more competition. So MOS also enables the creation of individual accounts and codes that allows for promotion and um, potentially to facilitate application of subsidies for, for special groups. Um, in California, we have a lot of those, I'm sure mother, other states and counties have those as well. Okay, next slide. So, okay, so that was the big picture. <laughs> and we had to focus on what we could kind of do within a year. We were on a really tight timeline. So um, basically our short-term goals were integrated of, integration of transit service, uh, services across transit agencies and between fixed routes, um, demand responsive Transit and VOGO, our volunteer rides program. Reservations for VOGO and our demand responsive transit, as well as streamlining transit payments and subsidies. So today, what can VAMOS do? Well, it can, it does allow for transit planning across 14 transit agencies throughout San Joaquin and San Luis County. 
Um, it provides turn-by-turn -turn walking directions and real-time arrival information for those agencies that have this available. So we were able to link um, demand responsive transit to fixed route transit. However, um, we weren't able to allow direct reservations with demand responsive transit because of the issue I mentioned before. However, um, the information on how to reserve a trip is pops up in your trip planning um, screen. So we have recently um, integrated reservations for VOGO and that is now functional and working. And we were also able to um, integrate sep separate um, bicycle trip planning, but it's not integrated with transit yet. Okay, next slide, please. So these are all the transit agencies we worked with. Um, for a number of them, we, we did have to create the GTFS data set for them. Not all of them had it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is the video, uh, videos I'm going to show. It would be really helpful if I could see this now. Um, I'm wondering if I can see the screen. Do you want me to hit uh, start for the video? Yes, um, okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you to end it when it, because um, it'll go on too long. Okay, all right, okay. just tell me when. Okay, go ahead. Decide okay. To spend. So this, this little video shows um, an inter-county transit trip plan from Stockton to Modesto. Those are in, in our, our two San Joaquin, oops, is it not working? Okay, it's there we go. Out. There we go, okay. Okay, it's Stockton in San Joaquin County to Modesto. This is a big deal because you know the counties don't really coordinate. But you can see the little Wi-Fi icon. This shows how you can schedule the trip, the three options, and you can do it by date and time. Okay. okay, here are your options. I think she's gonna show one. So here are the turn by turn directions. And this particular route um, suggests that you take a train and then you take a local bus. Okay, we can stop that and move to the next one. Okay, there we go. Oh, you're doing the same one. It's good. Oh. There we are, okay. Can you start it? Sure, Great. there we go. Okay, so this is this shows us a trip within a city called Mantica in San Joaquin County. And this is going to illustrate the Van Gogh microtransit service and bike route and directions. So here you've got a bus and a bike route that have been deemed feasible. So Flex, that's our Van Gogh, and it tells you to download the Van Gogh app and then you can reserve there. And then this is just information about the bicycle route. Okay, we can stop it. Okay. How would you describe? Okay. Okay, oops, same one. Okay. This is right, this is right. Okay. Okay, this slide is gonna show deviated bus. Okay. Deviated shuttle bus. And it's going from Riverbank to Modesto in Stanislaus County. So the little um, Wi-Fi icons are real-time information. So here you've got Flex that pops up and it gives you information on how to call to reserve that deviated bus. Okay, so I think we can stop that and move okay. on to the next one in the interest of time. Okay, here's our VOGO reservation, our volunteer transportation res reservation. Should I hit that? Yes, please. So this is going from Oakdale in Stanislaus to French Camp 
and smaller community in uh, the San Joaquin Valley. Okay, see Vogo tops up right ahead and you can see that the um, other two transit um, rides in this area took about 12 hours. So, so that's why you get Vogo. Um, if someone wanted to take a transit ride, they could take, they could take transit for a duration of 12 hours or they could take Vogo. So um, it will only pop up if there are no other alternatives. Okay. Okay, how are we doing for time? Did you, anyone want to? Okay. So next steps for Vamos. So we were funded um, also like Dwight from the FTA's Innovated Mobility Innovate. I think I got the name wrong. I apologize. Anyway, it's FTA's IMI. Um, we were funded to integrate um, fare payment with transit planning in our app in Stanislaus and San Joaquin County. Stanislaus, I mean, sorry, uh, San Joaquin County Regional Transit District is the lead applicant on this. Um, we are also going to um, work on how we can standardize integration data and, and, and APIs with other mobility services that um, are available or will be available over the next couple of years in these regions, region including car sharing, ride hailing, and microtransit. And most importantly, we're, we're conducting a lot of outreach and um, institutional analysis and marketing analysis to understand the feasibility of implementing MOS with a rural collective of jurisdictions and counties. The cost for implementing MOS um, is, is, not, is feasible for a major city, but probably not so much for smaller rural counties um, and communities. So, you know, we're hoping we can have something to say about the feasibility of this um, moving forward. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'd like to just call out all our amazing project partners. I don't even think I have all of them here. Yeah. Um, QD and Trillium were directly our direct consultants um, with our MOS system. Okay, and I, if you can just forward to the next slide, that's it. Uh, thank you. And if you have any more questions that we can't answer today, please feel to reach out to me via email. Thank you. Okay. All right, and now you should be seeing uh, the email addresses of all our presenters if you want to contact any one of them. We have some interesting questions to start with, so I'll go right away. And again, please enter those in the Q&A box if you have any questions. The first two questions are very much related. Um, a question about readiness for MOSS, making yourselves ready, what does that mean, and how to start? And I don't know, Carol, if you want to start with that, and then we'll go to Caroline and Dwight. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's, there's so much information. It's almost like information overload. And that's why I like the question, particularly in a, in a rural area, how do, you, how do you start planning for this? A couple of the slides, I think in particular, that roadmap slide that I had, it's really a matter of the partnerships before anything else. And I think Dwight can speak to, he, he's in a county that works very well together and they did do a lot of planning. They sort of understood what the vision was and they were all willing to participate in moving it forward. I think from my perspective, looking at some of these things around the world, it doesn't work if those partnerships don't exist. So I'm imagining that a lot of the rural providers have already spent a fair amount of time talking about coordinating services. That's, that's thing one. 
And you've talked about that probably because you've been doing mobility management for a long time. And that's so mobility I, management is like, it's your, it's your 1.0 step to getting to MOS, which I would say is more like 3.0. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's the partnership thing. It's not just the sort of demand response providers. You know, then you, you've got to bring in whether you have car sharing, bike sharing, um, whether there's an existing carpool or van pool, whatever, and the, you know, transit. Everybody definitely needs to have a shared goal of what they're trying to do. The other thing that I see that doesn't work very well, and I think, Caroline, your examples are, are so good, is because of the planning that, that was done and willing to get out there and put something out there to see if it works. A lot of people are afraid of that. I think we need to do that because as you pointed out, we don't have a lot of great examples yes. to go from. So, so that's my two cents or less. Okay, and, and uh, Caroline, do you have an answer to that? Yeah, you, yeah I do. You know, for, I guess we did do a lot of planning in advance and we did, the grant kind of helped from ARB, helped organize us. But once we got that app and were able to show the policymakers that we had the app, it really got them moving independently. You know, independently, San Joaquin County um, did um, their fair integration plan. And independently, they decided to integrate that into to the MOSS platform. So I'm really seeing it, you know, we have eight counties and they're not, you know, they try to work together and they do work together really well, but there's no kind of overriding planning agency. And I, I think this is kind of giving them like I said, it's kind of a backbone. You know, we're hoping it can expand throughout the county because there is a lot of um, inter-county travel and rail in the county. So they are very, you know, I think it's it's become kind of a unifying force. And you know, every every situation is different. But I I wouldn't say that would work for everyone. But that's what I've worked I've I've seen here. In and California. Dwight, I'd say. Um... Carolyn's example, I find incredible because they went regional. I mean, scoping and the work, it's regional as opposed to, oh, we'll start with our county and then go regional. Um, so I applaud your bravery, collective bravery. <laughs> <laughs> um, mobility management and having a history of it, a successful history of it, a willingness to put money into it is completely essential because from, from that will come the collaboration and trust you need to, to move on. And I'll just stop there. Okay. We have, um, I'm sure we have tons of possible questions, but we're, I think we'll go a little bit longer because we still have some questions outstanding. Um, and for Caroline, there's a question for you about uh, how you integrated accessibility for people with disabilities into your MOS program, or is that a work in progress? Well, we do, right now we have in the car sharing, the, um, I can't remember what they're called, but the driver assist, uh, pedal assist, is if someone can help me, this is an operational question, an operational term. But we, we provide those, people can reserve those in advance. Um, we, we, we don't do anything else right now. I mean, I just, it's what we want to do and we're moving forward with this in the future. This was a very, um, this pilot has really only run for about a year and we're just, but that is definitely um, on our radar and we will be speaking to our funders to make sure that it is front and center um, and if they agree to fund us in the next, um, for a next tranche of expansion. And Cheryl, if I can just 
Sure. Sort of. Um, I've been looking at the accessibility question in Moss for several years now. And I guess the good and bad of COVID-19 is that some of the brand new Moss platforms are not only looking at the availability of seats on vehicles, but they're also looking at the availability, for example, of accessible spaces yeah. on vehicles. And they're looking at some other, you know, some other issues that are so very important in accessible travel. So, you know, if someone's traveling um, in a, they're going from a rural to an urban environment, they may be traveling to an urban environment where they need to be concerned about elevators and escalators. And so you need information on that as well. You know, again, that, that sort of complete trip uh, that, that we're all talking about now. So I think the good thing is we're starting to see more innovation about adding the accessibility features. The one issue that I will mention about eligibility because that's an agency by agency decision of, of individuals being eligible for ADA service, that's a little bit tougher nut to crack because everybody does their own eligibility process. It's not universal, which is a bummer, but we won't go there. Right. So that's a different webinar. And, but but we need to keep those issues raised. And, and Rachel, yes. that's why I'm glad you asked it. Several years back, I wrote a paper about how do we bring accessibility into this. And the technology has changed so much. We just need to keep that ball in the air. We right. Need to keep asking those questions of the people who are not only providing the technology platforms, but the service providers, because we got a bunch of service providers out there who still refuse to basically provide uh, accessible vehicles and things like that. So. Uh, I do have um, something else to mention about that. California is recently kind of following Chicago's model where they are taxing the, um, the PUC here is taxing um, Uber and Lyft, the ride hailing companies. And we're hoping that that money will, will become a fund where, whereby um, you know, we can, can purchase these vehicles and you know, perhaps through, through an, a MOS app, they could be made available you know, for ride hailing or other, t or, or other services. Okay. Right. And it's important to point out, I think, what you've both kind of um, alluded to, which is accessibility is not one thing. It's not just wheelchair access. It's access for people with cognitive disabilities, exactly. people with sensory disabilities. Yes. Those all have to be taken into account. And they're not always in the kind of mainstream uh, thought process around loss. Right. And, and with that, I think we, uh, we will call it a day. Thank everybody for their patience with our technical difficulties. And I think we've had great information, even information from some of our participants, which I'll share as well. We will post this, uh, this webinar so anyone can access it and access the, the slides and a transcript. Um, and Carol's white paper, of course, when it when it comes out. So thank you to our presenters. Uh, you're doing such great work, and I am sure that we will have uh, future programs highlighting what you're doing because I'm sure that you'll also learn a lot in the next uh, year or two as things go forward. Thank okay. you very much. For, All right. For okay. Everybody, stay well. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.